Thank you. Thank you. Uh, as Stefan was saying, I, 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 I work, worked mainly in, in product design and, and development at IDEO for many years and worked in medical devices. And currently, I, I, I kind of have my own gig economy, so I, I spend time in, in three different arenas and domains right now. I, so I work in innovation, um, I work in venture, and then I work in these kind of future visions. And I remember as an early designer in the 90s around here making fun of these futurist people. There was the Institute of the Future, and now I actually work with the, the guy who ran Institute of the Future, Paul Sappho. Um, and um, now I've, I've kind of understood the value of looking out into the future and thinking about how we, how we actually move towards, towards that. So I'm going to, um, I enjoy, it's very stimulating, I enjoy trying to keep myself honest and being able to create future visions that are, that are out there that are, you would actually think about investing in and how would you take a future vision and turn that into an investment thesis. But like you, I've, I've also had like my butt in the seat in terms of product development and being responsible responsible for that. So those are, those are some of the other, um, the, the, you know, having to do it in a hands-on way keeps you honest for, for future visions. Speaking of future visions, over the last few years I've worked with a, with a collaborative team in San Francisco called the futureof.org. Um, if you want to see any of our future, future of sports or future medicine reports, they're, they're free um, at, at that website. So today I'm going to talk about three, sp three areas. Exponential thinking, future forecasting, and, and how we use storytelling in there, and then explore some bumps in the road. So this third part is actually some new content that I've just developed in the last month, and I'm, and I'm excited to share it with you guys today. So what is exponential thinking? Um, exponential thinking, as we were just talking about before, before uh, this lunch, is um, it, it started in this place called Singularity University. It's either a long rollerblade or run or bike ride up the, up the, up the Bay Trail. Um, we're on NASA, NASA, next to NASA Ames on the Moffett Field side. And simply, SU kind of aims big in terms of trying to help big companies governments, entrepreneurs, developmental organizations, investors, try to think about how the implication of exponential technologies and use those to, to aim at some big human challenges that, that, that we're seeing play out today. Singularity University was founded in, out of the passion um, and resources of, of Peter Diamandis and Ray Kurzweil. And, uh, Ray is a kind of classic futurist in, in terms of looking at the math of where and projecting out um, certain trends. So he's the kind of person that said Jeopardy will be, or uh, Watson will beat a human in Jeopardy at, in this year, and he's been correct in, in, in many of those. He's also an inventor, and I think he has the original patent for OCR, so character recognition. And he's working at, uh, on voice stuff over at Google. Um, Peter Diamandis was a trained MD uh, and bold thinker and uh, is, is most well known for his XPRIZE work in using um, incentive-based innovation contests to, to kind of push, push things, push big things forward. So they formed Singularity University over a three-day weekend. Many of the folks that were attended that three-day weekend as a kind of think tank retreat are still integral or kind of in the, the spirit or soul of, of singularity these days still. So officially, I would say the mission and the mission statement has probably evolved over the last 10 years. It's the 10 year anniversary of that, of that uh, fateful three day workshop. So the mission is to educate, inspire, empower leaders to apply exponential technologies to address humanity's grand challenges. That is a mouthful and it's a big task and we are a university that does not confer degrees, so we have executive programs, summer programs, we have a venture space, we have an incubator, all of those kind of things. So we're, we try to kind of rally all of the, the, the possible arms as, as ways to, to kind of get after this challenge. And so I'm gonna talk about today is how we as people and humans and leaders need to think about these exponential trends and why it feels like everything is going so quickly these days. All right, so I'm going to touch on a few of these uh, exponential thinking and the law of accelerating returns, which is a, a fancy way of saying things are going quickly. Um, but let's think about our human development. 250,000 years, we're kind of local and linear. 
we were born and probably died and had this beautiful sh short 30 year lifespan in within a few kilometers of where we were born, right? That was, that was our existence, that's our DNA. We are linear thinkers by nature. And so here's what's been happening recently and over the, uh, over the past 50 years, this is, this is this, you know, the now famous diagram of, of Facebook and all of the connections and all of these things have changed so rapidly around us, but yet we are still linear biological humans trying to figure out what the heck is going on in this, in this space. So the, the only thing we do know is that tomorrow will not be like today. And one of the difficulties of that is, again, back to the linear and, uh, and exponential part, the, the really tough part is for humans to understand the exponential function. Does everybody, any math whizzes or somebody who wrote their PhD on, the exponential, on, uh, on Moore's law or anything like that? No, okay. So I've tried to show this in a couple of different ways and flatten this because you, we've seen too many curves that go kind of up and to the right. So this is a way to try to help you understand the exponential function and why things feel like they're progressing so quickly. So 30 paces is probably from, from the stage back to the back row where my friend Melissa is. Um, so th we can understand that those 30, or li 30 linear steps, we've done that in the past, we can measure it, we can pace ourselves there, but if we take those, each of those steps exponentially and double that over that time period, the 30th exponential step will be something like 500 millionth of the, that first step, right? So that's to the moon and back or something like that. It's a big, big space. It's really hard for us to comprehend. All right, so I'm gonna play a short game um, and we call this the exponential penny. And the exponential penny doubles in value every day. And so who wants to, who wants to play with me? Who is not a math whiz or CFO? Don't make me cold call. This is why I became a faculty member. All right, you, sir. Exponential penny. So when, if I'm gonna, uh, the game is, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you, offer you either a million dollars or the exponential penny over a, over a short time period. Which would you like to have over, let's say, a week or two? A million dollars worth of pennies? Yep. A million dollars. A million dollars, okay. All right, so it sounds like a good bet. And I think, you, I think bounding it by, by that time period is, is the trick here. So in, at day 15, it's doubled, but it's only $163. So you, right now, you're still in the money. But if we keep playing this out, I'm hoping that this is gonna pay off for a good Christmas for me. Day 25, 325,000, and it doesn't go until day 27, it, I'm in the money, right? So it's tipped over there, and then it just takes off, right? So day 30, New Year's, New Year's Eve this year, that'll be 10 million, so I've 10X'd my, my bet against you, and then we've day 37, just seven days later, we're at 1.4 billion. So it's a hard, you know, I just play that game to make sure people understand, never, never let your kid's allowance double every week or you're gonna be in the poorhouse very, very quickly. But this is, this, is a, this is a trick for us to just all understand how we bet against these, bet against ourselves. So I'm gonna reframe that million dollar bet and into this curve, which is kind of a famous one around singularity. So if we think about this linear, think about that linear line as the million dollars. And now you have created a project or a proposal or an investment, and you're pretty sure, you've told your boss that that million dollars is, is a sure thing, right? And that feels good. If like we, a million dollars over that time period would be a good payoff. But it turns out that that's, in, in a lot of ways, that turns out to be the path of doom because at a certain point when that crosses over, that's when I, you know, in 37 days, I've made 1.4 billion and you're sitting on a, mil a million dollars, right? So this is a tough thing for us to be able to determine because the most dangerous part is when the yellow line is below the linear curve, or sorry, between the, bet below the line here, right? We've all been there in terms of projects or, or bets or investments, and it looks like it's below the line. 
and you're going to be your your storytelling like crazy expectation management you're trying to figure out how if ever it's going to get above that line and um, and when it is so and that is the the trick in in this time period so linear versus exponential and and I'll and I'll share a little bit more why why this is cognitively difficult for us all right so to explain that I'll try to uh, I'll go into a little bit around the law of accelerating returns and so back to our friend Peter D or sorry Ray Kurzweil um, he looked, he started to map everything in terms of the progression. And so this is a progression of basically our human existence. And it was very flat for thousands and thousands of years. And over the last thousand years, it's basically gone straight up. And this is the difficult part for us as humans to, to, to kind of understand. There's a little bit of cognitive dissonance here because we're on this steep curve. We're always on this steep curve, and if we look back, it looks linear. So if we're on the steepest part of the curve, we look back and it actually looks linear. We look forward and it looks linear, but it's actually going straight up. So this is the difficult part because we are, we're humans, we're existing on this very steep part, and that's that, that, that plus the exponential penny game is is why this is hard to hard and we have to kind of train ourselves and unlearn some of some of the things that that uh, we have reinforced in our in our training in our careers all right so you guys don't need to you can explain moore's law better better than i can but i think that it's, it's important to understand that this if 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 we believe this over 20 years of of semiconductor development um, then we, we take this understanding and, and apply it a little bit further, right? So Ray Kurzweil took, took Moore's law and w instead of going forward, he went backwards first. So he looked at the history of, of computing and looked at each paradigm. So the integrated circuit, Moore's law, really kind of was meant to, meant to think about just integrated circuits. But if you looked at the transistor or vacuum tube or relay or electromechanical, they all map to pretty much a, a, an exponential or, or logarithmic progression, right? And so this, this is the beginning of, of kind of the law of accelerating returns, which means if things go from analog to digital, they should behave not exactly like Moore's law, but a lot more closely to Moore's law than something in a linear process. I, I, I would I'd love to have a, um, some more time with you guys to debate whether you think Moore's law is actually live or is dying or whether we're just waiting for the next version of it to come. So if we think about integrated circuits and all of the other, all of the other computing power, is that what's the, what's the next thing? And, and so of course there's you know, you guys are driving a lot of this. A lot of our neighbors around here are driving this in, in GPUs and chip design, quantum computing. And so it's likely that all of these exponential curves are probably going to stack on top of each other, but they will still go through this, this kind of progression, very similar um, and adhere to that, to that law of accelerating returns. All right, this was a picture of me in 1984 with $350,000 of technology. And you guys have done a great job of, of dematerializing that and um, demonetizing that and basically putting that all for free you know, in, a, in a smartphone, right? The smartphone and all of the services have disrupted all of this cool technology, the boom box, the, the, the media, the printers, the calculators, all of that cool stuff, the Walkman that I loved. Um, that I spent all of my uh, my friends' bar mitzvah money on, that was, you know, that that's what it has has occurred, and we we experienced that stuff in in not just in in this space, but in many other spaces. You know, the, this is the Kodak moment, this is the Airbnb moment, all of those kind of kind of things where where all of the things and assets that people have built up over many years have gone through that process of being demonetized and dematerialized. But it doesn't just happen, and we'll come back to this later in the talk, this doesn't just happen in, in information technology and chip design. We're seeing this in, in as things, again, if they go from analog to digital, and as we've seen the um, genomics go from an analog like little pipettes and, and mass spectrometers and all of that kind of stuff that we learned in, in biochemistry, this, this is now 
onto the law of accelerating returns. And so this is the precipitous drop in the cost of sequencing a full genome. And you'll see this is, this is actually at exponential. And then you'll see in the middle, there's a couple of times where it goes faster than exponential pace. Does anybody have an idea of why that happened? Was it better computing? Turns out it was, there was when either collaboration or a big set of like iterative learning happened during that moment. Three universities got together and actually shared their data and their learnings, and they were able to iterate quite quickly, and it dropped in, you know, from $10 million down to, to $100,000 really more quickly than it should have. So this kind of law of accelerating returns is really about a human, a human part of collaboration and learning. And so we'll, we'll that'll remember those themes because they'll come up later. OK, so Dr. Ray says, if Dr. Ray says it, it's got to be true. Um, we won't experience 100 years of progress in the 21st century. It'll be more like 20,000 years of progress at today's rate. And I think he, and he's talking about some of that, the, the pace of technology, about, but also about how quickly we as humans and also machines are learning uh, very quickly. So I want to share a couple of examples in the space of um, artificial intelligence and machine learning. Any uh, Go or chess fans in the audience? No? So chess is one of those things that you can actually model out in a way and learn and probably and, and use some artificial intelligence and machine learning and beat humans pretty quickly, right? I remember learning chess on a simulator as a teenager and getting beat by the machine quite rapidly. I don't, I don't know if that was the machine or my chess skills, but the reason that um, games in general are a great play area, no pun intended, for, for machine learning and, and researchers is that you can play a lot of them, you can play them digitally, and there's not a lot of consequence, right? We're not talking about a surgery or a political decision or, or something like that. The, you can play them and there's, there's a lot of iteration, a lot of chance for learning and low consequence for, for, for what happens. So, uh, this is the, the now famous kind of story of how machine learning and AlphaGo have uh, first beat uh, a, a human Go player. And so I'm going to show a progression of when, when they started to actually take this novel approach of having um, a machine learning uh, algorithm actually play itself. So in this case, what they did was take um, no prior knowledge of the game, and basic, basically the, on, the only the rules of the game is the input. And within three days of, of a million, millions of iterations playing each other, just two machines playing each other and learning as they go, they were able to go through this progression and essentially surpass not only all of the previous machine learning uh, tricks and tools, but be able to beat all of these humans uh, pretty, pretty repeatedly. Right? So that's pretty cool. But that's just a game. That's just the game of Go. So, but what's behind that? So it's this thing called adversarial machine learning. I like reinforcement learning, but adversarial actually turns out is tech, more technically correct. Here's another trick that they've been using in machine learning. So that two AIs were basically taught each other how to fake photographs. So if you'll see the progression on the left, of these people, just be, these celebrity pictures being able to be altered. Does anybody recognize this guy in the middle on the bottom here? I think he was on The Bachelor. No, he's fake. That picture, all of those pictures on the right were created as fake photos with, with a machine learning tool. So that's what some of the things that it becomes a little bit more human. So we've got the game of Go. That's a good learning, learning platform. We have these fairly real things, like if you want to skim through your Instagram feed and try to figure out which influencer marketing people, are they real or are they fake? I'm not sure. I, I started to look at my feed a little differently after I saw this demonstration. OK, so I'm going to show you a video here. Try to make it a little bit more real, a little back to some of the things that self-driving cars that we see around the valley, things that our friends and you guys might be working on. So here, I want to, before I play this, I just want to say nobody gets hurt in, in, this, uh, in this video. All right. Thank you. 
All right, nobody gets hurt that badly. Okay, did anybody hear a beep in there? Okay, what do you think that beep was? It was a warning. All right, so I'm gonna play the video again. I want you to see, look for the, use your human eyes, look for your evidence of what, an accident and listen for the beep. One point seven seconds before you could kind of see an accident happening, that beeped. So that's that's the that's the dash cam in a, in a Tesla looking through the the back of two other cars and seeing an accident ha starting to happen. So I think this stuff I, I showed those three examples in progression as a ways to like bring it home to. This is not just being applied to the game of Go or the game of chess. It's not just being applied to um, you know, things like uh, faking celebrity photographs or figuring out if a cat is real on Instagram. This is, this is real life. This was two years ago, and it's, and it's only gotten better from there. All right, so I'm going to switch gears and talk a little bit about, so how do we think about, so that's exponential thinking. Things are going quickly. Hopefully, you have started to highlight how you might need to start to think about your awareness of linear versus exponential and how we, how we start to train ourselves to think about exponential pace. So I was, in, I was in Toronto a couple of weeks ago, and they made fun of me for this slide because it's not an outdoor rink, and somebody had a Wayne Gretzky story. Probably all of that is lost on, on all of us. But there is this old adage by Wayne Gretzky about good players skate to where the puck is, great ones skate to where the puck is going. And so let's, I take that as inspiration, certainly as a sports geek, I, 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 I appreciate that. So if we think about, we're here, and we think about this linear future and a dis, an exponential future, how do we get here and not here? Because I th one of the important things, and back to my progression as a futurist and as an investor and as an innovator, you have to think about if you build a business or make a bet based on your today's insights and you bring that to market, you're already behind. So you're already behind where the puck is being being flowed through the, uh, across the across the the rink, and so you need to be able to think about this longer term space. So. Um, we were talking about this at, at lunch uh, just prior, and the, the use of science fiction as a way to create these visions of the future so that we can stay ahead and try to understand where the puck is going. And I'll give you some, some fun examples since I grew up in science fiction. All right, so this one, this one is from the World's Fair in 1939. So what do we see in this picture? Looks like, uh, looks like dad is not paying attention to the wheel and that they're playing dominoes or some board game. So this is, self this is a vision of self-driving cars in 1939. This is very similar to a, you know, a concept that, that we saw last year or the year before about how, how self-driving cars will be a lounge or will get work done or will be the health clinic of the future. So that was 1939, we've been building at all this time and just to try to figure out how to do this. None of the technology was ready, were we psychologically ready, but the, the vision was there in 1939. Anybody a Star Trek fan? I can summarize all of Star Trek by they beam down to a planet, it's basically a Shakespeare story, the guy in the red shirt gets killed, and then the doctor, Bones, he pulls out this little tricorder and tries to figure out what has just happened on this alien planet, right? So the tricorder is this magical medical diagnostic device as a w that would help us understand what, what's going on, right? And so we've been working in the medical device and diagnostic space for years to try to, to, try to do, uh, get that. It's being built now. It's not quite there. This was the closest version. The X, X Prize ran a, uh, a tricorder contest, I think two or three years ago, and the, and the closest they could get was kind of a kit of parts. So there, there's probably 20 basic diagnostics that you need to run, and they were able to do that, but not, certainly not in like a smartphone format that, we, that, that science fiction has, has told us. So uh, science fiction, all right, everybody remember this? This was 2003, I think. 
right? And, and so we're just getting to this place, thanks to folks like you guys and Magic, Magic Leap and all, HoloLens and all of these people, even, even just kind of the augmented reality um, uh, developer kits that, we've, that have been launched in the last year or two, we're just now able to, to kind of envision what these interactions and, and future extended reality, as we like to call it, um, would, would be. So here's a version a couple of years ago that Google built into a chip. It's basically really small radar, and you're able to use kind of wire, uh, you know, hands-free gestures in, in terms of directing, uh, directing interfaces. And so they integrated this into a jacket, so you'd be able to swipe through a door or answer a phone call or something like that. So it's coming, but not yet, not yet there. Again, still science fiction. Sorry about this slide. Didn't think I was going to have a, such a massive uh, display to, today. So uh, actually, I have some partners uh, at Singularity at Lowe's, the home improvement um, superstore, uh, built a, basically a hollow deck in this, in this warehouse in Los Angeles to try to get after this idea of Star Trek again, the hollow deck, where you're able to walk in and kind of have this immersive, dynamic environment and, and have it change kind of on the, on the fly, right? So that's, that's pretty cool. But they were actually, they took it a step further and they've decided that the hollow deck was a perfect metaphor and a perfect platform to be able to actually say what the inside of our house should, should look like. We all want to go to Lowe's and we want to buy the new kitchen. We don't want to buy the thousand pieces parts that are required and all the labor and all the know-how to, to try to figure out that new kitchen. We just want to demolish it and have it magically appear. So that's what they've tried to build, which is they, they first they built it on, on an iPad, or like a, just, a, just on a regular tablet. They built it on a phone. They built it on, on, on just different displays to then getting into this place where they're actually be able to use some sort of augmented reality and walk into your kitchen of the future. So they call this the marriage saver because you're able to look at this space and argue in digital and in virtual reality of whether the, the, you know, the refrigerator should go over here or that wall is yellow and then press buy for $30,000 $30, and just be done with it, right? Okay, I, I really wish we had that. Okay, so again, writing science fiction as, as a way to help stretch our boundaries. And science fiction does, does two things. I heard some laughter during, during as I was describing those stories. One thing it does, science fiction, we believe in it. It helps us defer judgment. It helps us like stretch our horizon and think about these spaces and get into those worlds, right? I'll, I'll reveal my, my age for if, if in, in when I was seven years old, Star Trek launched or sorry, sorry, Star Wars with the first Star Wars movie. And I've spent the last 40 years trying to get into the Star Wars universe, right? Like it's a, it's a real immersive story and it, it kind of captures our attention. So science fiction as a way to, to stretch, stretch our horizon. Now bringing it back to if you have to do that, um, that's all well and good, but your boss wants to know what are you going to do this, you know, this quarter or this year or next year. So there's a kind of a traditional strategy approach of doing that and then doing a, what we call a retrocast. So you're able to create this big vision of the future and then work backwards and figure out what needs to happen, what milestones, what technology needs to progress, what investment, what all sorts of all sorts of things. So um, stretch your boundaries and then kind of retrocast. To, to make it make it real for yourself. All right. So I'm going to switch gears, and so I promised the uh, the experimental part of the talk here. So I was working on an internal piece for Singularity on the future of design, and I kind of backed my way into this idea that we're driving ourselves into these technology cul-de-sacs. We get excited about the, the, the promise of, of new technology, and what we, what's happening is we've, we've, we understand that technologies are not really the only answer, and we, need, we really need to understand some of the implications. And we're iterating so quickly that we may actually not have time or the effort or the patience to design um, the right thing. We're designing it, we're getting it out there, all with the best intentions, but we may be ending up in these kind of little dead ends, 
or these cul-de-sacs. And let me, and I grew up on a cul-de-sac in, in Florida, and um, we didn't have a tennis court, so we played tennis in the middle of the cul-de-sac, and it was very nice. We had houses around them, but there was a big curb around there, and there was nothing you could do. You could jump over it with a skateboard or build a ramp and jump a bike over it or something like that, but you were kind of stuck in this cul-de-sac. You were not driving through to sit to your friend's house on the other block. So I think it's this interesting metaphor for what we are kind of doing these days. We kind of, so let's, let's take the example of today and we're trying to get to fully autonomous vehicles. And there's some technology progression and it's really actually more, more likely broken down into technology milestones, whatever, whether if it's level one, two, three, four, five, autonomous driving or different levels of gradation, right? But we're ending up on the way there, we hit these cul-de-sacs and that's okay. But we just kind of need to acknowledge we're, we're in a cul-de-sac and then I'll introduce a way to, 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 to think about how, how to potentially break out of these cul-de-sacs. So let's, let's, let's hear a little bit about some of these cul-de-sacs. A technology cul-de-sac, you're trying to understand the implications of it and you go down this path and you just, there's unintended consequences or there's just unresolved concerns. And these are ripped from, uh, you don't have to be a futurist, you can just be looking at the newspaper over this past weekend and see a climate report on Friday, CRISPR gene editing and twins birthed in China yesterday or, or Sunday. So it doesn't take a futurist to be able, but you need to understand some of these signals. You look at those and you feel like you're immediately into the cul-de-sac. What do you mean they had babies with gene editing? What does that mean? So I think it, it introduces us into these, into these areas where we have unresolved concerns. Could be ethical, could, could be something that we just, that's not what we meant for that. It wasn't intended for that, but now we're in this space. So let's talk about a few real ones. So there's uh, certainly ethical dilemmas around AI, uh, whether it's gonna drive, what's the meaning of humanity if, if AI takes our jobs and, and do, makes the decisions for us. But even before that, there was a report uh, called the Moral Machine. And so we're worried in the first part of autonomous cars about whether, whether it's gonna make the right decision. And we're gonna, who are we gonna blame? We're, we're kind of a litigious society, so we think about that and we say, I'm gonna blame the manufacturer. No, I'm gonna blame the person that created the LiDAR. No, nope, I'm, I'm gonna blame the person that created the road that, that, that had this, this, this issue. But it actually, the Moral Machine Report, what it revealed was that it, all, of those, all of those ethical kind of framework depends on where we lived and where we grew up as to who we're gonna blame and who we're looking for. So it's getting more, it gets more, a little bit more complicated. So let's take another one, uh, cellular agriculture, a space I'm particularly excited about. Um, and this is kind of the manufactured meat. Has anybody had like an, an impossible burger at a local, local place, right? Like, so that's a first prototype, maybe not a first prototype, hopefully it's a little more evolved, but like that represents where this space should be going. So cellular agriculture is, harvesting the DNA from an animal, for example, and taking that forward, bio, and not even bioengineering it. You don't even have to change it, you just have to manufacture more. So this is a really interesting space for, for sustainable food and global food sources. So that's cool, but are we okay with that? Or we just look at it and we say, I'm okay with it, I just don't wanna buy it. I just don't, I mean, that's fine for somebody else, but I want the real burger because I grew up in Texas and I want the, you know, I want the burger and, and not this idea that we, can, that we might actually be able to feed our world through, through kind of cellular agriculture. So we're in this kind of a little, little bit of a conundrum there. Big data, we don't have to, so we might be going for something magical like democratized information, but we have these pathways unintended or maybe just sloppy in terms of things like Facebook and Cambridge Analytica or things like uh, very intended and engineered like the, the, the social credit system that's being implemented in, in, in China right now. So what do we do about those? Not sure. So climate change, uh, the, you know, uh, uh, the, uh, 
I was doing these slides as of yesterday, but I didn't. I still couldn't get the climate report like completely read and, and get incorporated in here. But we're constantly shown these climate reports that that seem to, and these are the ones that in workshops or in conversations that we have around singularity really grab the attention of everybody. We're like, okay, well that's fine. Let's you know, big data is is one thing, but climate change like. That, now you brought my kids into it, or now you brought my house into it. it. Like, it becomes personal very, very quickly. So I think these are, you know, we, California and super storms and wildfire season, it's becoming a lot more real for us. Microplastic and 50% of, of human fecal matter, that's a real thing. So how do we, how do we think about, about these things? And that's, that's a big one. All right, so I don't want to leave you on such a bummer because some of the brand of singularity, we, don't, we, do, we, we try to kind of, kind of move past that and, and, and present, a, a, a not a, if not a solution, a path forward or, or hopefully inspire others to create the path forward. So how might we go from cul-de-sacs to roundabouts? So dead ends to roundabouts. I, grew, I went to school in Boston, lived in Europe, so I'm very, very accustomed to going around in circles and finding the right exit. So, but think about those cul-de-sacs, that dead end, that beautiful Florida cul-de-sac that has a curb, houses all around it. It's our job to then figure out how do we break through those and create some, some roundabouts. So there's lots of ways to break over the curb. We can design something, we can invent some new technology. Often we're gonna have to commit resources or leadership or the purpose of, of our company or startup. We might need to reframe what the topic is. We might need to shift some cultural norms. We might need to connect or collaborate with big industry groups. We might need to invest or we might even have to compromise. So these, are, I wouldn't expect, these are all different actions that you, might, that you might take. One company might not have to take all of these or they might not take any of these, but somebody has to jump over the curb in order to, in order to make a difference here. All right, so I'll, I'll come back and just give you some examples. So let's revisit our AI and machine learning in, in cars. So there's lots of, lots of folks, billions of dollars. I just saw another electric car company um, that came out of stealth yesterday after nine years. How does a company stay in stealth for nine years? That's amazing. With $500 million in, in investment. So lots of, lots of people working on these, but if we're worried about that moral machine, we're excited because it prevents that accident that I showed you, but we're worried about what else could happen, right? So we may not, one of the key things, I sat with the head of commercialization of Waymo recently, and he basically said, like, the technology is not the issue. We're there, we're like in the 90s of percentage of certainty, but we may actually have to reframe how close do you need to be to be to 100% or do you actually just need to get close enough so that you're gonna save all of those lives of human error, right? A, a, a woman was distracted in Florida and, and, and rolled over seven cyclists. She wasn't drunk, she wasn't looking at her phone, she was just distracted. She looked in her glove compartment and ran over seven cyclists. That's a bummer. We could save a lot of lives if we just reframed that idea. We may have to invent some AI applications that have a lot more positive impact or, or make sure that people understand you're designing these with, with humanity as the core um, design principle. You might have to invest in retraining new AI-enabled workforces. So if truck drivers are gonna get disrupted, what role do we actually need to design? Is that, is that become a truck conductor? Is it becoming, what, who's, what's the air traffic controller of, of, of the trucking fleets of the future? So there are these new things that we actually need to, to invent. So lots of ways to get out of that cul-de-sac and, and create, some, create some roundabouts. I'll show you one more around cellular agriculture. We could also use synthetic biology, which is the kind of kissing cousin of cellular agriculture. Synthetic biology is basically you take um, DNA and you're able to actually change it or engineer it and then reinsert it. Cellular agriculture is just mimicking what's already there. You manufacture it instead of growing the cow, you manufacture the, the meat or the cow hide. And I'll, I'll share another example about that. But we might have to invent plant-based seafood products that actually have sufficient taste, right? I love sushi. 
I love, you know, shrimp. I grew up in Florida catching fish. I don't, I don't want to overfish the, the, the world's oceans, but I really enjoy that taste. I was visiting a friend at Google and had the algae-based shrimp. Has anybody had those or visited, visited down the street? They're okay. I mean, they're okay in a stir fry, but they're not, like, they're not that same feeling of, of having it. So we actually need to think about how we build that as a technology and actually invent it and make sure that that, uh, that has a sufficient taste as, as, as fickle consumers as we are. But we might actually have to reframe this idea that convince the public at large that not harming the ocean is a really cool idea. And we might need to change, uh, invest in biotechnologies that accelerates the commercialization of global foods, or we may, may need to create industry consortiums to collaborate on clean meat because they, need, they actually need that, that help and that collaboration. All right, so that's another one around food sources. So there's a stylistic version of this, which it kind of depends on where you are in, um, where you are in, in your posture of your company. So these are all kind of the extent to which you jump the curb or how you do it, right? You can elegantly bunny hop it. You could kind of, the way Tesla is doing it to the energy world is just bulldoze through it <laughs> over the curb. You can detour in some very creative ways, or you can go back to kind of my Boy Scout days of like my orienteering badge and, and try to figure out how to reroute through, through this. Or you may have to do all of those to, to, to in, in, the, in the same lifetime. But just different ways of taking those same roundabout approaches and roundabout verbs and, and turning them into, into something. So speaking of orienteering, so if we're, if we're on this journey towards fully autonomous vehicles, it's, it's very likely that we're gonna progress a little bit, get into one of these cul-de-sacs, but I trust that you know, there's a lot of smart, creative, driven, passionate people working on this. They'll figure out a way, they'll get through that part. So they get through that part, but they're likely, we're likely going to hit another cul-de-sac, right? We hit that the first time when the Uber, when the Uber um, test vehicle ran over somebody. We're gonna see more of those. We're gonna see when a AI doctor makes the wrong call or just makes a call that was a human call that was probably better informed, but it, it, it lost a life, right? We are going to hit more of those. So we may actually need to be able to backtrack and reorient ourselves and take another pathway and likely hit another cul-de-sac um, and before we're on our, on our path to, to kind of some, some beautiful target. So it is a bumpy road and uh, we wanted to, to kind of promote this idea of acknowledging that we've gotten ourselves into some of these cul-de-sacs and that there are ways using companies like yourselves, using um, all sorts of different resources to break through these curbs and, and go from cul-de-sacs to roundabouts. And companies are doing this. This is actually a company, Modern Meadow, um, that was born out of Singularity, that this is their path, and they do want to create that amazing um, burger from, from manufactured meat, but they know that it's a long pathway to there. They're still, their long game is to work through those bumpy pathways and figure out how to get us to, to that beautiful place, sustainable meat, in, low impact to the climate, but what they're doing in the meantime as their proof of principle is they're making really high-end manufactured leather. So they're able to tan these things, and we're more accepting of those things, and it's actually better leather. So there are, there are BMWs and Mercedes out there that have manufactured leather, not synthetic, it's real. It came from a cow, it just came from the DNA of a cow. That cow was not killed, but you can make a beautiful, um, kind of luxurious handbag or, or car seat, all of those kind of things without having to do, go through the normal process. So um, there are companies that are doing this. They have that mindset. They've committed to it, but they also see the short game and the, and the long game of this. So um, there are companies that are, that are doing it. So that's, that's confidence inspiring. So that's all that I have for today. Exponential thinking, how to go from linear to exponential and kind of help unlearn how to use science fiction as a, as a tool for future forecasting and telling ourselves good stories and our bosses good stories. 
and exploring and acknowledging some of the bumps in the road along this, uh, along this journey. So I'd love to take any questions or have a conversation with you guys. Thank you. Yes, sir. Howdy. Afternoon. Um, I think the real issue is that it's the problem of the exponential change in technology. It doesn't matter whether it's genetic, doesn't matter whether it's um, you know, graphical manipulation, it doesn't matter what it is. The simple fact is I don't think we have the means of understanding what does it mean to have things accelerating and changing that quickly. And that's not spoken out of fear, it's just truly saying, you know, we don't know. Right. And given the right. speed of that, it doesn't matter what you want to talk about, you know, in my opinion, gene editing, artificial intelligence, you name it. It's all changing incredibly fast. Right. It may be good, it may be bad. And you know, how do we you know, think through that without saying put on the brakes and stop and you know, live in a cave, but on the other hand, you don't want it just be you know, unregulated and going however fast it'll go after 30 days. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, after sitting through hundreds if not thousands of conversations with executive teams and executive um, program participants or, or companies or boards, there, there's always that moment where they understand and they figure out like, okay, we have, we're, a, we're a retail bank, so we kind of need to figure out this AI thing and figure out what to do with all of these analysts. So that's, that's our kind of job job. And that's the implication. But then they, you know, you know this term in doctor's offices, the doorknob conversation, right? You're finished with your physical. And then he goes for the doorknob and you're like, ah, it's about the, I, you know, there's, so the real worry is usually in that moment. And so we finish dinner, you finish a talk with the board of directors and they're like, Chris, what about, but about the, the climate thing is really bothersome. Or what about job inequality or, or wealth inequality? Or what do I do? What does this mean for my kids? And I think it becomes that all of that accelerates. So we're under, the good news is we're understanding some of the implications. Are we ready for some of those future conversations? I don't, I don't think so. Uh, a quick addendum, something that I noticed yeah. in your presentation, what you did just right now, you're talking about working with companies. You're yep. not talking about working with governments. You're not talking about working with, you know, NGOs, you're not talking about working with the larger aspects of society. And I think there are a lot of things that we're seeing right now where, you know, capitalism is great in a lot of ways, but you can't trust it and let it run unfettered. Right. You know, looking at Facebook, looking at whatever. Well, that, but what so, was interesting in my concern, and now I can put my finger on it, is you've talked about companies, but you haven't talked about the broader discussion that needs to happen, yeah. which is companies, societies, what have you. And, and that's a natural, we, we span all of those. I, I ran a workshop for the state of Wyoming in March about just this, about what they think about, how they leverage it, and how they can become a little bit more economically diverse, and what do they do about their kids that are all going to universities and leaving the state of Wyoming and not coming back. Um, so we're, we're definitely working with the, those kind of folks and all of the startups that, are, that you know, I, I as a seed stage investor, I actually don't invest and my, I can't get my guys to invest in singularity companies because those singularity companies are long-term risk, have like a big human global grand challenge associated with it. It's not, it's kind of outside that investment thesis. And that's not, that's a bad thing, right? We're, we actually are taking our, our eyes off of uh, some of these big spaces. So I, to I totally agree, but we are working in those, in, with those organizations. Yeah, the yes, question then is, it's not always easy to see the future. Almost 50 years ago, you know, we thought, okay, landing on the moon and then we'll have moon bases in 10 years. Mm -hmm. In that exponential curve, we just went flat. How, right. do, how do you know which ones are going to go and which ones won't? That is the trick. I mean, we were talking about that uh, just before as, as well around, like, how do, you, how do you follow all of those as projects or trends or technologies? Um, and... Um, there's not, a, I don't think there's not a great answer for that. I mean, I think all, many of those are in their, dis, still in their deceptive phase. They're still underneath the curve. Uh, I still want a flying car. I was pitched a flying car a year ago. There's, you know, there's three companies in the Bay Area working on flying cars. That is going to be, you think it's bad trying to get out of uh, San Jose or, or SFO with the number of Lyfts and Ubers all coming to the same gate at United? Come on, give me a break. But like flying cars trying to get into the Presidio or something, we're, we're going to get into another one of those, those cul-de-sacs very, very quickly. 
All right. Any other? I know. I knew that that third piece was that part stirs stirs things up. I'm glad you didn't have any questions about some of the earlier stuff. But yes, sir. Please. I would. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions on exponential thinking and sci-fi as Hi. well. Uh, what are your thoughts about the gap that's appearing between people who are accepting that exponential growth and quote-unquote yep. modern day luddites who? you know, would prefer it to be all, all analog and, uh, you know, are having a hard time adjusting themselves to the speed of innovation. Yeah, so there's, there's a bunch of theories around that and we can also take, again, from the headlines, um, you know, is uh, I, we see these things that people jump on the bandwagon, like Bitcoin, and now everybody else jumped in and we've dissolved it. So. That will, I think that's going to stem the tide of almost all interesting blockchain stuff for probably six months. Everybody's going to pull back, um, and except for those few that were in early in, in Bitcoin and they have enough resources to just keep going. And so I think that there is going, there, we're already seeing some of kind of bifurcation of, of access to resources and, and, and things like that. There is an even further out, talk about sci-fi, there, there, there are some people that talk about kind of species bifurcation in terms of thinking about integrating technology or access to gene editing or access to, to all of these um, exponential um, trends that, that, that help incorporate and extend our lives. That could, that could be even weirder. Um, frankly, so I think that those are there's there are those things that are a little bit science fiction, but I think we're going to see that quite a lot in access to education and access to opportunities for sure. So and and which is why that this is you know there there's we're on this like sharp edge of these some of these either ethical concerns or just unintended consequences. Like do, do you think that those people really try are trying to separate? society and bifurcate? I don't think so, but I think we should be able to use those technologies. It's, it's our purpose to help democratize some of those technologies in a way that, that many people could have access to those so that they're not, um, that, that they're not causing so many problems. <laughs>